This summer I've found at times that my mind has been wandering to going walking in the Lake District. If you know anything about me, you'll know that it's one of my go-to favourite places. It doesn't help that I belong to a group on Facebook that are always posting photos of where they have walked. I lose myself in what it must be like for them, and I recall the places that I have climbed to. The best thing about going up higher is that you go somewhere that you've never been before usually and it's the view at the top that really captivates. That is, if there's no clouds. In our reading today we see Jesus taking three of the disciples up the mountain. Was it to see the view? No, but there was something else he wanted them to see. I wonder what it was. We'll open that up shortly. You see, the Transfiguration is often referred to as a good passage to talk from about mountaintop experiences with God. We all hope that we'll get to experience God in a dramatic thunder and lightning sort of way, and regularly at that. Did these disciples have that experience? Although it's easy to spend our whole time waiting for a dramatic experience of God, more often than not we're disappointed. These flashes of God's glory are incredibly rare. I don't think the story of the Transfiguration is there to tell us that we can all have a mountaintop experience of God. I think it's there to reveal to us who Jesus really is. Jesus takes just Peter, James and John to pray with him. Incredibly, they are heavy with sleep when they get to the top of the mountain. I think this shows something of the disciples' inability to understand Jesus. On the mountaintop, his divinity is revealed to them, but they have to be woken up first. Perhaps that was because they relaxed too much at the top, admiring the view. They fall asleep, but then are woken up by a flashing light. Jesus is dazzling in in appearance. This is a wake-up call to you and me too. Far too often we are sleeping spiritually and don't see what God is doing around us until something spectacular happens. The disciples are woken out of their ignorance. They're sleeping to see the light of Christ. Just as in the Garden of Gethsemane, the humanity of Christ was fully revealed to them as they woke up from sleeping. So now we see them having to be woken again. The fact that they're asleep on both occasions speaks to me of the difficulty they had of really understanding who Jesus is. So the three of them, Peter, James and John, are woken up from their sleep by this lightning flashing. Somehow they see that Jesus is speaking to Moses and Elijah. Peter decides he needs to do something. Don't you just love him? I think if he were around today he'd have tried to take a photograph on his smartphone and it would have been on Instagram before you know it. His rather strange response is to want to create three tents. One for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. All the text tells us is that he didn't know what he was saying. Perhaps he was trying to preserve what he could see. Perhaps he was trying to be religious, showing how he wanted to worship. What is interesting is that as soon as he suggests making those tents, the cloud descends and the voice of God is heard. The cloud and the voice intervene just as Peter is trying to give equal importance to Moses, Elijah and Jesus. Unlike Peter, we know that Jesus is the very image of God, the firstborn of all creation, Paul calls him in Colossians 1. He is not equal to Moses and Elijah. He is their God. Peter's action highlights the tension between human nature and God's activity and presence in the world. Human nature has the desire to keep things where we can see them, the yearning for things to remain the same. God delights in making all things new, though. Peter is like you and me. Or should it be the other way around? And we are just like Peter. In wanting to preserve things, Peter's butting in and offering to build a dwelling for each of these three wonderful men. It's showing that he's not yet in a position to really understand Jesus. Have you ever been interrupted by God? 
when you're doing something, when you're busy at doing something you love or you're working and God intervenes and interrupts your life. You see, when God cuts you off, you can't help just be quiet. When I say he cuts you off, when he interrupts your life, when he stops you doing what it is that you're doing and calls you to attention, to listen to him. One moment he's being helpful to us and the next we're down on our knees. We're down on the floor listening to God and asking him to speak to us. God politely ignores Peter's suggestion to make dwellings for Jesus, Moses and Elijah. And he even ignores Moses and Elijah completely. Instead, God gives Peter and James and Jonathan a basic instruction. Jesus is my son. He's my beloved. I'm pleased with him. Listen to him. And then, just like that, God is gone. With an incident like that, it's reasonable to ask, what really is going on here? Jesus has just been transfigured. He's been turned inside out so that his most, most trusted disciples can see all of him, the divine as well as the human. They've been given an opportunity to see him in all his totality, in all of his complexity, in all of his paradoxical nature, God and humanity all rolled into one. But rather than being still so that it could sink in, Peter does what so many of us often do. He jumps into action and tries to contain the situation. And faced with something glorious but unexpected, he has tried to put Jesus in a box. Perhaps that's so he can keep things from changing again. If you've seen the film Cool Running, you will know that there are many threads running through it. And one of those threads stands out for me in the context of what we're talking about here. Junior is a member of the bobsleigh team, but his father wants him to be someone else, something that he has control over. It all comes to a head just before the final, as father demands that Junior returns home. Junior stands up to his father, and he refuses to be put into the box of parental choice. He stays in the team, and father has to learn the lesson. When God interrupts Peter, he is saying, nobody puts Jesus in a box. Peter knew Jesus pretty well, perhaps better than anyone else at the time. But even he didn't know all of Jesus. Even he couldn't contain him with preconceived notions of who or what he should be. He still had so much to learn. That's just like you and me, isn't it? We fall into the trap so often. It is so easy to get so wrapped up in making Jesus fit into our little boxes that we forget to listen to him. And in so doing, we want to be the ones who are right about Christ. And we want others to know that he's on our side of the argument. At the end of the day, Jesus challenges each one of us in different ways. We need to listen to him. And if we sit still in his wholeness, we may end up so challenged and so moved that we also will become changed to be like him. I wonder which mountain Jesus will want to take you to so that you can experience him in a new way and see him as he really is. Are you willing to let him take you to that mountain? He wants us to open our eyes our ears, our hearts and our minds so that we can listen to him and instead of forcing him into yet another box we can let him be who he really is. We need to listen with our eyes as we observe what he is doing around us. We need to listen with our ears so that we can hear him speaking through people and events. We need to listen with our hearts as we commit ourselves to him. God the Father comes into our life and he says, you're looking at everything the wrong way. Look instead to my son. Look to Jesus. 
That's what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember when Peter suggested that they put up those three tents to stay on the mountain? A cloud came and overshadowed them, and God's voice was heard. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Listen to my son. That's what God the Father says to us today. Listen to my son and trust in his word. Listen to him when he tells you about the way of his cross. Listen to him when he says your sins are forgiven. Listen to him when he promises that eternal glory will be yours. As we go into another week with restrictions placed upon us, we need a glimpse of the glory of the Lord to strengthen us for the days ahead. Will you let him take you where he wants to? Will you let him show you who he really is? Thank you.